Hey, welcome to part two of our conversation with Carl Nichols. If you missed part one, I'd encourage you to go back and get hold of that. You will really, really enjoy it. But let's listen in and uh, take some notes as you can if you're not driving and uh, you'll get some great content here in part two. Yeah, bro, uh, what, just, um, just kind of thinking on this thought of crisis and different things what what about um in the midst of crisis or even in challenge what have you learned about keeping like those relationships strong strong in those times and how important is that and just thinking about people you know in their marriages maybe even people who are single as well and also within your team uh what's the importance of that okay i'll give you an example and then maybe we can unpack some some thoughts from it so we were building this building um, it's about a six million dollar building that we were building, and then everything shuts down, and there's all these questions as to, okay, are we going to uh, have the funds to sustain? Are we going to be able to build a building at the cost that was quoted to us? Because all the recent, you know, like for example, pouring asphalt aggregate for asphalt skyrocketed, so we had a not to exceed budget. Obviously, there were some 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 hiccups there. The the builder went way over, and we had a conversation on the side that we're like, we, we have to deal with this. Well, in that season, it was probably the most stressful four months of my life. So not only are you dealing with COVID, we're trying to get into a building that we don't know when people are coming back. I'm trying to deal with all the legal stuff there. And the importance of relationships just for me, were, were, I didn't realize how bad I needed people just to embrace me and love me and care for me and say, hey, it's okay, we got your back. And I felt like in that season, that four month window, I was a little on, I was very on edge because I didn't know what tomorrow held. And it wasn't related to COVID as much as it was the financial components of all the building and various things of that nature. Cause you don't, you don't know what it's the unknown. And so for marriage, for example, in marriage, I don't know that I did the best job of communicating in that season, my wife, all the emotions that I was feeling. So I think, I think in the middle of crisis, we get in go mode. We don't slow down to say, okay, here's what's happening. Here's what's going on. And so processing that. So that's just kind of the married married you know version or the family version also not not losing sight of what your kids are going through and making sure you hear and they they see so just keeping those open lines of communication and i think from a staff and leadership perspective or a team perspective don't always i think you in crisis you have to assume that people are struggling not that okay we just gotta because i'm i'm a more let's go solve the problem let's go fix it but not everybody's wired that way and so they're processing in a different way and so understanding people we talk a lot about temperament here we talk a lot about the way you were you were wired before you develop the personality through your life what is your natural wiring so we've done a lot of temperament understanding here about our team and what that means and how to communicate with one another and so i think if you want to keep relationships strong you, you just have to show that you care about one another and unfortunately we don't always hear and communicate in the same way so you got to learn about the people know more about the people. I understand my wife better today through temperament counseling and various things than I did five years ago. I understand my kids better today because I understand myself better. So there's a lot of that. Our whole staff is going through temperament counseling. We're learning about each other. Learning, I'm learning to lead them better. They're learning to respond to me better and they're senior leaders. And so I think just communication is a key to every, every relationship, right? And so uh, not only do we have to communicate, we have to communicate effectively and understand how to communicate with different different types of mindsets, personalities, temperaments. Mm. Very good. Mm, really good. So we, we've talked a little bit there, Carl, about culture and <clears throat> I guess having the right type of culture in the church and trying to build out. What, what, what could you share with us today and with our listeners around this idea of, of creating a positive and healthy culture within the church to really cause it to grow? Yeah. Okay. So culture is probably one of my biggest passions. I think, uh, I heard something yeah. about 10 years ago that really made me understand. Well, about 16 years ago, I heard somebody say the number one job of a pastor, whether you agree or disagree with this statement or not, is irrelevant. I think yeah. and whether I agreed with it was irrelevant. What it was important was that it made me think differently. He made the statement. Arun McManus said a pastor should be a cultural architect, meaning you must design and build culture for sustainability. And I've done a lot of real estate in my life and own a real estate company on the side. And uh, it made me start thinking about culture in the church and in team settings, much like it would if I were building a house. What's it going to look like? What's the structure? What's the systems? All of those things. But but cultural architect is different than designing a house. So what are the systems within the church? How do we sustain those systems? Well, culture is the, the soil 
that allows things to grow. At the root word of culture is the same word as cultivate. So I'm cultivating something that can take root and has health and strength and roots that can sustain. And so um, a couple thoughts on culture that I have. Um, culture becomes the worst behavior that the leader is willing to tolerate. And so if I tolerate um, a staff member just showing up late, I'm going to eventually have a late culture. Um, if I tolerate, you know, negativity amongst our staff or, or, or talking about people rather than talking to people, what's going to happen is I'm going to have a staff full of disgruntled people. That's going to be the culture of my team. And so we say you have to understand who you are, your mission, obviously, but your values are so important. What is it that you value? Because yeah. values drive behaviors and behaviors yeah. create culture. So if you look at every culture across the world, it's a set of agreed upon behaviors. They interact with each other in certain ways. That's what creates Southern culture, Northern culture in the States, European culture, British culture. It's how you interact with one another. Well, we want to set a set of values that says, here's how we're going to define how we react and respond to one another. So relevant, we have two sets of values. We have our church values and we have our staff values. Our staff values are how we're interacting with our staff. So one of our staff values is uh, we embrace brave communication. In other words, we're going to talk to one another about real issues rather than talking about one another. So that's how we're, we're going to have hard conversations. That's what we value because that's how you're going to be able to create a culture of solving problems and winning. Another staff value is um, we um, we finish the five. So the la we say the last excellence is in the last five percent. We're not going to leave anything undone. We believe the last five percent is almost as important as the first ninety-five. So we hold people accountable. Hey, when you didn't finish. You know, you came in, we did Easter, but we left the building in a mess. Well, that was the last 5%. And so then the next ministry came in and the next ministry got hurt because of our lack of finishing. So uh, we, we let those values drive our behaviors and then those behaviors create, create culture. And so a couple just, I don't know, tweetable things about culture. Um, the, the, you have to work twice as hard on culture as you do on vision because a good vision will die in a bad culture. So if I take and put seeds in bad soil, it doesn't matter how good the seed is. The seed's not going to survive. Mm -hmm. So a good vision dies in a bad culture. Here's the, the other thing. A bad, an, an average vision, just an average, what you and I would consider, well, okay, it's, it's, it sounds good. Let's see how it plays itself out, can thrive in a great culture. So I use the example. I have a 15-year-old son, an 11-year-old son. I can say to my boys, Hey, boys, I want you to grow up. I want you to go to this college. I want you to be a doctor. We're going to do it this way. And I have this elaborate vision for their life. And I have, okay, this is what I desire for your life. But if I create a toxic culture in my home, they're leaving when they're 18. They don't care what dad says. So a good vision, a positive vision can die in a bad culture. But if I say to my boys, I want you to grow up, love Jesus, love your wife, and do whatever God calls you to do. We know that's a big vision, but it's really generic, if that makes sense. It's not even clear. It's just... Okay, whatever, got it. But I cultivate in my home a culture of interaction and embracing and challenging the process and godliness and communication. Now I've created a healthy culture for that seemingly unclear vision to take root and grow and become something great. So I, I say all the time, past, pastors want to work on their vision. They want to know what's coming. And I say, work on your culture of your staff and of your church because otherwise it don't matter. It, that, that stuff is going to, you're going to get an initial success or initial bump, and then it's going to fade if the culture can't sustain. No, uh, yeah, I love that. I love that, and uh, love the cultural architects. Um, I actually heard, um, I think it was Rich Wilkinson Jr. say a phrase: uh, "Culture either happens by design or by default." And, yes. And uh, you can either design it or it'll just happen yeah, by definitely. default. So just thinking about those <clears throat> values and um, mm. just the things in terms of like with your team, how do you make sure they're not just um, like values on a wall or, you know, on a bit of paper, but actually they're outworked? I know you use the word accountability, but how does that yeah. look for you in your church and, you know, uh, for you as uh, as a pastor as well? Sure. A couple of things that I would say, first of all, I say this, um, you can make the right, the wrong decision for the right reason, the right value, and, and we can work through it. It can be the wrong decision. But if you make a, a, a cultural, like if you, if you violate a value when making a decision, that's a tougher conversation. 
So, yeah. uh, you know, especially when it comes to church values or staff values, those are, those are two, both of those matter. It depends on the context you're in. So if you, if, if you, if you violate a value because like, for example, we have um, transformational environments. That's one of our values at our church values. We create an environment and allow the Holy Spirit to transform hearts. We want to do everything we can to break down walls. So let's say you're trying to create a transformational environment and you, you think this was the way to go, but it ended up being a flop. But you come and say, I really thought I was trying to create a transformational environment. Says, well, you made the wrong decision. We're going to learn from it. But if you just fail to acknowledge that we, we're trying to create a transformational environment and you get sloppy or you get lazy or you don't finish the fight, well, then we're going to have a tough conversation about that. Now, here's where we have a feedback format. Uh, our senior staff or whoever your direct report is will meet with you um, five times a year, six times a year, really. Because a year in review, every every two months we come together. We have three questions we ask each other, um, or that our senior staff would ask the, the the person reports directly. It's a thirty minute meeting. That's it. The first one is this: What have you done, and what have, and who have you developed in the last sixty days? So we're, we're we're and then when that comes out, we obviously write that down. Okay, I don't want a list of things that you you know. I've I've had lunch with seven people. Well, that doesn't tell me anything. But if I've I've poured into three people and moved them into a level of leadership, that's a different conversation. So we're, we're checking there to see if our staff is, uh, we call it a feedback format. Feedback goes both ways. So if our yeah. staff is telling us things that don't, don't really align with our ba- values, it's easy for us to say, hey, that, that's not really accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish. So that's number one. The second question is, what are you going to be working on the next 60 days? Same kind of feedback format. The third question is, what do you need from me and as a senior staff or your leader? And so they have the ability and they have to say something. They can't say nothing. They have to say something. And then at the bottom, there's a red box. The bottom of that red box, the, the senior staff then has to say, here's what I need you to do better at the next 60 days. I want you to focus on this value. And it has to align, not just, hey, I need you to you know, do more meetings or whatever. It's more like, okay, I, I've noticed that you offend people with the way you talk to people. You're not honoring our staff in that. I need you to focus on that the next 60 days. So then there's, there's feedback formats there. So that's, that's one component. Of that, another way uh, that we ensure that, like on a church level, that we're that we're not violating our values, at least that we're um, mm-hmm. making sure that we're that we're staying true to our values. In our in our what many people would call next steps, we we call it welcome to relevant, which is um, just a conversation where we here, here's who relevant church is, here's how you can get involved, here's what what opportunities are ahead of you if you want to. We do a thing interactive kind of conversation where we talk about our eight values and then we'll do four and then we'll teach another four. But after each four, they meet at tables and they discuss where have you seen these values in our church? So we're listening to make sure that all eight of those values are being seen. So then when they come back and they say, I noticed that, you know, authentic community is a value. And so, man, the first time I came here, I I just, it just felt like home. Well, we're winning in that. That's an immediate feedback format. If any one of those eight values we quit hearing about something might be wrong. So that's a feedback format that we kind of embrace to say, here's an opportunity for people who are new to our church to tell us, I was able to notice, you know, visionary leadership. I was able to notice limitless generosity. I was able to notice this by, and give us tangible examples of that. So those are feedback formats that allow us to hold people accountable and hold ourselves accountable. Mm. Good really good, yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, I've just been thinking through a couple of things you've mentioned there, Carl. I mean, you've, we've talked a lot on culture. We've talked a lot on, I guess I would describe it as having candid conversations with people because mm. uh, that's really key to have those strong conversations when things do go wrong or even when things are going right. But what, what, what is communication, like having good communication as a, a church or staff or leadership, what, what value do you play on that? And what do you do to make really good and clear communication well, I think my one of my biggest weaknesses is I assume people know what's in my head. Um, even when we started the podcast, you're like, okay, let's go ahead and jump into them. I, I, I can come in like a bull in a china shop and just go and just – and I don't want to be that, especially when we're being recorded, right? And, uh, and so I think <laughs> one of those things is I – people don't know what they don't know. And just because I know it doesn't mean they don't – they know it. So I've had to build in yeah, some things for myself to make sure that I'm actually downloading what's in here in a clear way. For example, mm-hmm. I can go lead a staff meeting and then my wife can come up and go, does that make sense? And everybody's like, nope, I have no idea what he's talking about. 
He went too fast. I didn't get it all. And then she'll go through and say, okay, let's make sure we understand. She leads a staff meeting. And I'm like, why are you, why are you saying all this? They should get it. They should know these things. That's just a wiring issue. So what I've realized is clear communication in an ongoing way is not necessarily my strength. And that's okay. But I've had to put people around me because when you talk about communication, I think there's three things that we have said as a church, as a team. There's probably a dozen more that other people can add, but these are things that we do in an ongoing way. We say we need clarity. I mentioned this earlier, over certainty. So yeah. if the staff is looking for direction or where we're going or what's happening next, or they need, hey, you know, when are we going to make this decision? I don't have to have all the answers, but they need enough clarity to continue to move forward to create culture. Otherwise, you create a culture that's very much like, I don't know what's going on. Nobody ever tells us anything or they tell us one thing and they do another. So it, we've gotten to the point where we tell people what we do know and then we're clear about what we don't know. So um, we don't know. People are saying right now, when are we going to go to three services um, on a Sunday? Because we're getting to the place where we almost have to do that. And the answer is um, not before here, but we don't know beyond that. that that's, that's the answer. Well, okay, well, that didn't really tell us. That just means you've got until Easter, right, <laughs> to, to kind of work this out. We're not going to do it before <laughs> Easter, but we don't know after that. Yeah. We, we, we don't know. And we can't make – but what we need you to do is we need you to be prepared to pull the trigger on that. In about two weeks, you need, you're going to get two weeks notice. You're going to have to be prepared. So that's certainty is, is, is not, we didn't answer the certainty question there, but we were very clear about expectations and people are okay with that because they, they trust that you're going to come back again with clarity and know what they need to do. So I think that's number one. Number two, I would say, goes back to what we just said, create a reward and a feedback culture. There's got to be checkpoints because what will happen is you'll find out real clear, real quickly when you sit down with somebody for 30 minutes every two months. First of all, there's got to be those checkpoints that aren't so far apart that, oh, well, now we're you know six months from having our last conversation. I didn't realize you had drifted so far. Every 60 days is a good rhythm for us where it's like, okay, great. Here's where I see you doing well. Here's where I think you need work. Here's where you've drifted. Those are just opportunities for conversations. And I also think there needs to be a reward system. I, this is not something we've built into like some kind of systematic approach, but but we build it into the rhythms of communication. So um, if we, we have once a month a staff meeting where we just share wins, that's all we do. We share wins and what gets rewarded gets repeated. If ministries aren't getting, there's no wins in the ministry, that's a natural feedback conversation. So again, that's communicating what's important in those situations versus going, well, this ministry is doing this and you're not doing this. They hear, they know. And it's challenging to one another. And then the third one, I would say, this is a systematic thing. So two are kind of philosophical, clarity over certainty and create feedback culture with checkpoints. But this is a, a something that's worked for us. It's called the RACI principle. So you have four letters that create an acronym, R-A-C-I. The R stands for what group of people are responsible for doing something, fulfilling something, executing something. Those people, like for example, we have... Um, we have a group of engagement specialists on our team. So we have different people from different ministries, but they're very good at creating environments that engage people. So when it comes to Easter lobby experience, Christmas lobby experience, Mother's Day lobby experience, we put five, those five people in a room and say, go figure it out. Y'all are responsible for making the lobby experience happening on the kids wing and in the, in the main lobby. So then one of those people will be assigned as the accountable person. So RA, A stands for accountable. That means that person's got to pull the team together. The buck stops with that person. It might be a different people, a person every time, depending on the season. You know, if we're in a big season, um, you know, in October, that's a season where we have our, we celebrate our birthday as a church, but we also do some things that are outreach related. Well, I'm not going to put my kids director over two teams in that season because she's, she's, she can be pulled in, in multiple directions. So we say this person's accountable and here's the deadline. So that person calls the meetings, makes that all the things happen. They're the person that if it fails, we're going to go to them. They also have the ability when they're accountable to say, so-and-so is not pulling their weight. They're not showing up for the meetings. They're not coming. They're being difficult. They have that ability. Okay. Then there's the consultant, the C, R-A-C-I, the consulting component. There will be times, for example, where the only, I don't need to be responsible or accountable, but I need to be consulted. Your senior staff needs to be consulted. You might need to consult another ministry to make sure 
what you're going to do in that lobby space doesn't interfere with guest services or whatever it may be. So this is just a conversation, getting feedback so that you can make a better decision. And then here's the one that we struggle with the most, and we are getting better and better and better at it as we've streamlined. The I is who needs to be informed. So we can sit in a room, we can make, you're responsible, you're accountable, we can consult, and now we make all these decisions. And more often than not, the people that need to be informed are our volunteers. And they show up and don't know what's going on because we did all this work and then didn't inform them. So now you create a culture, if you're not careful, if you don't inform people of what they need. And here's the thing, not everybody needs to be informed of everything. And I've told our staff, you've got to be comfortable not being in every meeting. You've got to be comfortable showing up sometimes on Sundays going, I didn't know this was happening. That's just part of a growing church. But the informed component, if our guest services team shows up for something and our lobby experience team has come up and done all this stuff in their space and they weren't informed, now we've got a cultural issue. So that's how we keep that communication amongst you know various ministries in a large church. Uh, it's just a simple checkpoint. Hey, let's apply the racing principle to this before we leave today. And then once it's applied, now we just got to have those checkpoints to revisit it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And mm. ju- just thinking of that racy principle for a moment there, and just to really get the nuts and bolts of that, if we can, um, is that more just of a verbal communication or is that like a document Do you get your guys to go through and actually write something in that, almost like a template? How, how do you guys do that? You know, I think this is where um, I, I'm not the type of, if I'm assigning it, then, then they're required to write it down and their senior staff's making sure that they, they got it. I'm not, I'm not writing anything yeah. down um, because that wears me out. That's a mental task. Yeah, I think yeah. there are some churches that would structure and it would be good. If you have, we don't have, yeah. you know, if we use the racy principle and everything, we would probably have it in some kind of, you know, uh, in our base camp thread, which is our inner office communication and various things. There are times, however, if it's a big Easter event or a Christmas event or something where it's multiple yeah. teams and there will be a message board that will go out that will have that in that. But if it's a small task, like, Hey, I need a group of you guys to get together and um, think through, you know, traffic flow in the parking lot because our parking lot slammed, you know, that's not something we're going to put on paper. That's a, that's a something in two weeks we can have an answer to, you know what I mean? So I think it depends on the size of the task and, and, and really how many people are going to need to be informed and what needs to be documented along the way. Got it. Oh, awesome. Brilliant. No, I think there's so much uh, right throughout our conversation that people can take away. One of the things we, we love to do to finish off with is some uh, quick fire questions. So uh, get ready, call these uh, quick fire in your face questions. So here we go. What are you most excited about at the moment? Uh, well, two things. I would say one on a personal level, I'm excited that I'm finally getting to take my sabbatical that I was supposed to take in 2020. Uh, I'm taking a month off in September and the family's been wanting to come over there to you guys. I mean, we're, we're doing a Mediterranean yeah, cruise, exactly. I say to you guys, in your area. So I'm really excited about having that month with a family just to, to kind of disconnect. On a, um, on a ministry and leadership level, I'm really excited because we've just kind of redesigned our approach toward groups and we're seeing incredible just life change happen in our groups and uh, we're in a deep study of the new Testament in our groups. And I'm excited. I think, I think that's going to change our church. I think it's going to change people's families there. I mean, we got families doing the adult version of the discipleship. We got kids doing the kid version, having conversations. So that's very, very exciting because I think it's going to pay dividends long, long over the long haul. Very, awesome. very good. Now that, that is a quick fire question, mm. but you have dropped something there that could be interesting at another point yeah. uh, because uh, that sort of stuff groups, you're doing around yeah. groups and the life transformation, mm-hmm. I think that could be a different conversation at another point, Carl, for another sure. podcast. Mm. But hey, what, what, are you, what are you most challenged about at the moment? Well, I think um, we live on the south side of Atlanta and the south side of Atlanta is um, the one of the lower income sides of the city and it's not poverty but the type of ministry we do is not 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 inexpensive and i think the the biggest challenge that we're facing is we have this nice building we have you know our our budget all those things are working incredible but we really want to start a counseling center and uh we have counseling we we have one counselor on staff we have a second one coming on staff i shouldn't say a counseling center we want to start a wholeness and wellness center um, that includes drug and alcohol rehabilitation, that includes, you know, health and fitness, all kinds of things that go into the, making the person whole. And just to be honest with you, we're not in a place where we're even close to being able to financially do that because that's another 
you know, million and a half minimum dollar project. And we're, we're getting our feet back under us from building a $5.8 million building and opening it with nobody in the building. So things are strong. Things are healthy for what we're doing now. But the challenge is the mission and the vision that we have is like, we want this. This is the long game, right? This is the thing we're talking about. Like yeah. we have to look two or three years down the road because we need it. We feel like we need it now. We see 120 clients a month, and we can't. And we're bringing on a new new counselor. I mean, we and there and that one's the new counselor coming on is backed up already. We have another counseling center looking to partner with us. We're meeting with them tomorrow at the time of this recording. So this is a lot of challenges. It's, here's what I say: it's yeah. it's not a problem to solve. It's attention to manage. The issue, though, when you see people bringing all the hurt, the pain that things are going through, it can feel like a crisis to solve. And so for us, we have to trust God's sovereignty in that, but it's definitely a challenging, uh, it's a challenging road to know how and when to tackle that crisis. Yeah. Great answer. Yeah. So Carl, what are your uh, two, top two book recommendations and uh, a quick why behind them? Yeah. So let me give you one personal and one leadership. Uh, first of all, I love to listen to audio books, but I'm not a, I'm not the best reader or the best writer. Um, so I hear things. That's my best way of learning. So I've had to force myself to, to read a book a month and then an audio book, everything else. But I'm going to give you two simple ones because I think uh, a lot of times I'll hear people say, oh, you got to read this book. And, and, and it's a book everybody's heard of or it's a book that's you know very deep and hard to process. So let me give you a personal one. The personal one is I love um, Hillary Morgan Ferrer's book, Mama Bear Apologetics. Um, she talks a lot about, especially in the American culture, and I know this is not unique to America, but, but, uh, empowering your kids to understand and live out God's design culture has hijacked, um, so many things and twisting the way, um, our kids view God. So that one, and then she has another one about sexuality as well, which is great. Mama Bear's apologetic God to sexuality. So those two kind of go hand in hand. And then one that I mentioned earlier it's called pro Procrastinate on Purpose. That one is, uh, is, is just pure gold. Rory Vaden writes that one. And uh, it's just the ability to learn when to make decisions that you don't feel like you're making the decision over and over and over again. So in a nutshell, it's, it's learning to have a great return on time investment is what it is. So. Right, great. Great, great answers yeah. there. And, and who inspires you the most? at the moment in the world it could be anybody you know i, I knew you would probably ask that question and um I, i'm not one to say this about um about my kids it's probably the first time i've ever said it um, but i do have a 15 year old that i'm very encouraged and inspired by right now not and look it might not be Brilliant. long i haven't ever said this he's 15 but he's in college he's uh he's gonna have a two-year degree and he's gonna graduate high school by the time he's 17 so that's inspiring, but on a deeper level, the, he's really wrestling with this call to ministry. And so he, he does feel called to ministry to, to do full-time ministry in some capacity. And that, man, that'll inspire you as a pastor, as a dad, as a husband, as a Christ follower, to keep doing what you're doing, to invest into him. And then I got an 11-year-old that I'm like, okay, he's inspiring me to continue to do good with my 11-year-old. So I know that's Probably not the answer most would give when you start, start talking about who inspires you the most in the world. I'm not in, look, yeah, yeah. There, he's a 15 year old teenager. I'm still his dad. I still have to deal with that stuff, yeah. but I'm inspired at what God's doing in his life. Yeah. And yeah. so I can watch a lot of, listen to a lot of podcasts, watch a lot of clips yeah, yeah. and not be near as inspired as when I see him doing his devotionals, serving in his church, asking God what it is he, he has for his future and those types of things. So. Yeah. Hey, that's a great answer. That's awesome, and, uh, yeah. I'm sure the, your sons will be really encouraged by that. Mm. Uh, so a big shout out to them as well for, for doing so yeah. well. So the ways that uh, you, you've given us, the ways to connect with you are uh, through website, www.thegoodlife.cc. Also, uh, you can uh, follow Carl Nichols, uh, all one word on Instagram, and also on Facebook uh, is Nichols Carl. Uh, just after facebook.com. Um, but Carl, it's been amazing to have you on the Church yeah, Explained yeah. podcast and uh, thanks so much for your time. No, that's great. That Good Life podcast, that goodlife.cc is the podcast that we do here. And so you can, I, I just link that rather than putting all the platforms. And so if you want more content, more conversations around just how to find the good life in Christ, man, that's where you can find it. So thank you all for having me. It's been a joy.
It's been a pleasure to have you with us. And a big shout out to all that you're doing with the church there, Relevant Church, and all the guys there, all the team. And all the staff Thank there as well. Uh, it's it's great to uh, yeah, yeah. hear what's happening. Yeah. So that's it for the Church Explained podcast. Yes. Want to thank you for joining us on uh, this episode. Don't forget you to rate, review, subscribe, and share this episode uh, wherever you're consuming this content. And don't forget there are free resources for you and your church at Icon Church forward slash Open. But we look forward to seeing you next time on the Church Explained podcast. We'll see you soon.